Dear Chan, why do I have ants crawling all over my body at times during meditation? <laughs> why you have ants? Well, that's very, that is uh, maybe because you are sitting in the wrong place. <laughs> I don't know. I think. Uh, Achan, I think it's the feeling of uh, ants. Not, not ah, I see the feeling of ants. Okay, not, not actually real ants. I see, I see. Okay, feeling of ants crawling. Um, uh, I think I, it's very hard to know exactly what that is. Maybe it's because you, your blood circulation or your nerves are pinched or something like that. Maybe you're sitting in a way which is not good for the body. That could be a reason. It could be as simple as that, that you're not sitting in a good posture. Try a slightly different posture. Huh? Try maybe raising yourself up a little bit so there's less pressure huh? yeah, on certain parts of the body. Huh? And then see if that can, uh, you can overcome the kind of you know, ant feeling by, by doing that. Huh? If, that, if, it isn't, if that is not the problem, then it could just be a matter of perception. Yeah? You are perceiving something and for some reason, the mind is seeing something. And if that is the case, if it's just a matter of perception, then I would recommend just to ignore it. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Let it be there, but carry on with the meditation. As long as you feel mentally comfortable, as long as your mind is at ease and you feel that you have a good state of mind, then you can carry on with the meditation. Then it's just a perceptual thing which is disturbing you. Uh, if your mind feels not balanced in a certain way, well, that is where you have to be careful. If you feel a lack of balance in the mind, uh, that is when you have to kind of maybe pull back a little bit uh, and stop the meditation or whatever. Uh. Good morning, Achan. What's the qualities and functions of being a Kalyana Mitta? How to be a Kalyana Mitta? Well, a Kalyana Mitta is someone who encourages you to live well. Yeah, this is one of the main things about the Kalyana Mitta. If you look at the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, there's many levels here, but the kind of most basic Kalyana Mitta, the Kalyana Mitta that you have in ordinary life, like your friends at the BGF or the friends that you have in the Dhamma, these are people that encourage you to live, live well. Huh? If you look at the definition of sila, of morality or of kindness in the suttas, uh, there's many factors to that sila. One of the factors of sila is to, for yourself, to live well, yeah, to live according to the precepts and all of these kind of things. But another factor of sila is to encourage other people to do the same, yeah. This is actually a factor of sila. And of course, so, so if you have friends who encourage you to live in the right way, friends who treat you in such a way that you feel encouraged to live well, well, then it is a that is a wonderful thing that we can do for others. This is the idea of Kalanamitta. This does not mean that you should go around telling everybody off, yeah, saying, oh, don't do this, do that. That is not really what it means. The encouragement has to be positive. It has to be a feeling of being cared for by other people, yeah? not kind of being pushed around, because then it becomes like, can become self-righteous. It can become negative in a certain way. Yeah? So this is the basic idea of Kalanamitta, but the higher level of Kalanamitta is the, you know, is a teacher, it's like the Buddha, where the Buddha tells you, you know, this is the Dhamma, this is the right view, this is how you practice, this is the, <coughs> the way the world works, <coughs> this is the way the mind works, and then when you live in this way, you will attain more happiness. So Kalanamitta is all of these things that encourages you to do what to, to live well. It encourages you to maybe to understand the word of the Buddha. And ultimately, it is about being a teacher. Yeah, a teacher who teaches Dhamma, teaches meditation practice. And all of these things are different aspects of uh, being a good Kalanamitta. <clears throat> okay. Dear Chan. How does kindness ensure bad habits discarded do not arise again? Example, the TV addiction story. Um, <clears throat> well, the, re the reason why you get addicted is because you are lacking in some kind of happiness. Addiction is where we are lacking something inside and then we allow ourselves to be addicted by something external. 
to try to avoid suffering. This is how this is kind of one of the problems of addiction. And that's why it can be very hard to overcome because the person is usually suffering. That's why they are addicted. They want to blot out the suffering in their life. Yeah, this is what alcohol is often about and these kind of things. Or it can be just as, as, uh, uh, as innocent as television. That can be a similar kind of thing. Yeah? yeah, basically we are addicted to sensual pleasures. And that addiction is um, actually a very uh, deep-seated one. So to be able to avoid that kind of addiction, you have to find another kind of happiness. That other kind of happiness will then stop you from being addicted to TV or sensual pleasures or anything. And that happiness is the happiness of the spiritual path. It is the happiness that comes from kindness. Yeah? When we are kind, we tend to feel more content with ourselves, more happy with ourselves more ability to appreciate ourselves. We have more loving kindness towards ourselves and compassion for ourselves. So uh, that is why kindness is so important. Kindness makes you feel good about yourself. And then you can, uh, that is the beginning of spiritual happiness that you then develop to a deeper level. And uh, then gradually you overcome your addiction to sensual pleasures. Uh, and uh, which includes then the TV, yeah, it, I mean, watching TV is very kind of innocuous and very innocent, uh, but there are far worse addictions like addictions to alcohol. Addiction to alcohol can be very, very bad, yeah, very, very destructive. Uh, so, yes. Dear Chan, in the Satipatthana, it was mentioned on the practice of four foundations as the direct path to purification leading to liberation. Was absorption and jhana mentioned in the Sutta? Yes, it is. It is part of the Satipatthana Sutta. It's one of the things I mentioned. The first thing I want to say is I, I don't like the translation foundation of mindfulness. I think it is a misleading translation because it gives the idea that you are developing mindfulness through Satipatthana. But actually, that is not really what's going on. What you are doing is that you are using mindfulness as an ability to focus on the meditation object. So I think something like the focuses of mindfulness or the applications of mindfulness or the establishing of mindfulness is better than the foundations of mindfulness. So that is the first uh, uh, kind of point. Uh, but um, uh, the second point is that the Satipatthana Sutta itself includes the Samadhi practices. And I actually pointed that out as we were going through it. Uh, I mentioned the point under feeling you have the Niramisa Sukha the spiritual happiness and the spiritual happiness is actually defined as the jhanas in the suttas, uh, samadhi. When you go to the mind, uh, yeah, the uh, chitta nupasana, you find uh, all of these terms that actually have to do with samadhi and jhana, the uh, free, the freed mind, yeah, the uh, the um, uh, the expansive mind, uh, the uh, stilled mind, uh, uh, the uh, supreme mind and all of these things are actually references to samadhi and jhana practices. Uh, and now we're just looking now at the uh, Dhamma Nupassana and Dhamma Nupassana includes the seven factors of awakening. We're just looking at them right now. And of course, the seven factors of awakening have the samadhi sambhojanga, the upeka sambhojanga, and this is jhana. These are states of samadhi. Uh, so it is actually included in the Satipatthana Sutta. So on the one hand, Satipatthana, the idea of Satipatthana is normally that it leads to Samadhi. That is how Satipatthana is explained throughout the suttas. But in the larger context, when it includes the Samadhi, which is a, a more rare context, then it leads all the way to awakening because it includes the Samadhi within it. So there is the ordinary Satipatthana that leads to Samadhi, and then there's the expanded version of Satipatthana that takes you all the way to awakening, yeah? and then it includes Samadhi. Achan, some believe that the prerequisite for Satipatthana is the jhana, because read of desire and aversion infers absence of five hindrances. Any comments? I think just answer. Um, I, I would say it, it it depends what you mean by Satipatthana. Some people would argue that Satipatthana is, is the insight practice you do to achieve awakening, yeah? to become a stream mentor or whatever. And if that is what you mean by Satipatthana, well then, yes, it means the jhanas are a prerequisite. 
But uh, I think Satipatthana is much more than that. In fact, the main aspect of Satipatthana is actually to take you to Samadhi. That is the main aspect of Satipatthana. The main aspect is not what you do after Jhana Samadhi, but what you do beforehand. So because of that, I would say that um, the idea of having given up desire and aversion for the world, uh, it, is, it is the same thing that you do under right effort. You are lowering, you are reducing your desire and aversion for the world of the five senses. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you have a attained full samadhi yet. It means that your mind is relatively peaceful. You have a degree of mindfulness, uh, but you don't have the full um, uh, stillness that comes after uh, samadhi. And the reason why I say this is because this is the, the way that the, uh, Satipatthana is explained throughout the suttas. It always comes before samadhi. It is a tool that leads to samadhi. It is not the tool after samadhi. Yeah? This is why on the Noble Eightfold Path, Satipatthana comes first, then comes samadhi. Same is true for the five spiritual faculties. The same is true for now the seven factors of awakening. Now these are core ideas in the suttas. This is what the Buddha calls the 37 bodhipakya dhammas, the 37 aids to awakening. This is the essence of what the dhamma is about. So because this is what the essence of the dhamma is about, these are the critical things on how we understand how the path works. So I, I know that Ajahn Brahm often teaches like this, but, and the reason why I think Ajahn Brahm teaches like this, the idea that uh, Satipatthana comes after jhana, because Ajahn Brahm, okay, he takes the samadhi as the foundation. Yeah? For him, the samadhi is the basis. How then do you move from samadhi to real insight? Uh, and that is what he is looking at. Uh, and because he is looking at Satipatthana from that point of view, then he argues that uh, having abandoned desire and aversion for the world means the fact that you have already attained jhana. But I, to my mind, that is a, only one small side of Satipatthana. The main side of Satipatthana is actually achieving samadhi. And I think Ajahn Brahm agrees with me on that one. I mean, I have discussed these things with him many, many times. It is just a matter of difference and emphasis, really. And I think that is kind of what, what this really is about. Ajahn, some believe that Satipatthana are, is about where we should focus our mindfulness on shaking up the notion of self because we see ourselves in these four areas body, feeling, mind, and principles. Any comments? Um, well, the, the um, this is the idea because uh, Satipatthana is very often said to be the same as Vipassana practice. They say Vipassana is Satipatthana and they interpret this in this way. And this comes from, you will have noticed this idea of looking at the liability to originate, liability to vanish, liability to originate and vanish. That one line that we have looked at before. Huh? And, but that line, as I argued, does not seem to be original to the Satipatthana Sutta. And if it is not original, then this whole idea that this really is about seeing things in a deep way, understanding the five khandhas as non-self and all of these things, it really falls away and it doesn't really make sense anymore. And um, uh, again, when you look at uh, the sequence that we find in the Noble Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, you have the Satipatthana before Samadhi. If you really want to understand non-self properly, you need Samadhi first. You can really only understand non-self by having Samadhi. So the whole progress of Satipatthana, the fact that it comes before Samadhi, means that the purpose of Satipatthana is actually to achieve Samadhi. Then when you achieve Samadhi, then you will be able to see the deep nature of the five khandhas. So this is, um, I think, an important point. Of course, if you undervalue samadhi, if you undervalue the idea of the jhanas or whatever, uh, uh, then you are going to have to find non-self without them. And if you're going to find non-self without the jhanas, well, then it makes sense that you do it through satipatthana practice. Uh, but if we're going to follow the Noble Eightfold Path properly, we have to bring samadhi and jhana into the practice. Otherwise, it's not going to work. 
But it's also possible to use the idea of non-self in a more limited way to help our meditation. Yeah. And for example, what we can do is we can, you know, when you even if you get a little bit calm, even if you don't get into deep samadhi, but you have some nice experience, maybe some bliss or pity, maybe some tranquility that is really, uh, really delightful. And then you come out afterwards and you can have some insight into what is happening. You can see, okay, the body was gone. Wow, that is a wonderful thing when the body was gone. And, but when things start to go and they disappear in this way, you have a little bit of insight into non-self. Because things that can disappear, if they can really go completely, especially if you don't have access to them anymore, it means that they are more likely to be non-self. Ultimately, when it's completely gone, you know that these things are non-self. So you can have like a preliminary understanding of these things, yeah? Like your thinking mind, many people identify with a thinking mind. But if you can see that actually, I feel much more happy when I don't think, yeah? When the mind is peaceful, there's nothing going on. Actually, that's much better. Why do I identify with a thinking mind? And what you're doing there is you're undermining the identity with the thinking mind. And that is like an aspect of non-self. So you can use it in a limited extent in this way, huh? but you cannot use it in the full extent of actually achieving the full insight into non-self. That happens after samadhi. Huh? So uh, it really depends what you mean. But uh, uh, so it really, you know, you, you can use these things in skillful ways, uh, but you have to be careful to do it in the right way. Huh? Only then does it really work properly, if you know what I mean. There's, there's a sequence to this. You have to understand the sequence. Uh, then you will be okay. Yeah, Chan. For meta meditation, can we include the departed or only for living beings? Um, <laughs> this is one of those questions, and I think it is uh, said in the Visuddhi Manga you should not include the departed uh, when you do meta meditation. I think the the reasoning is that, well, if you think about people who have died, you might become sad, yeah? Or they have died, you become sad about it. So for that reason, you, you shouldn't include them. But I think that depends on your inclination. It depends, people probably uh, deal with these things in different ways. And I would say, if you don't feel sad, maybe you feel happy about thinking about the departed. Maybe you think, yay, my parents are somewhere in the heavenly realm because they were so good parents. Well done, parents. Oh, I hope you are so happy up there. May you be well and happy. Or some, someone else, if it has a good connotation to you, if it doesn't make you feel sad, but a positive connotation, you can also include the departed. I don't see any reason why not. Test it out. See how it works. If it, if it doesn't work, then don't do it. If it works, then do it. Yeah, Chan. Is my daily scolding, nagging, and screaming when they are hearing these senses disappears towards my kids affecting my sealer, even though it was done with good intention? Is this the reason for the sloth and topper that I'm constantly facing? I, 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 so you, you're saying that daily scolding you are you are scolding your kids is that what you're saying yeah uh, okay <laughs> yes that that could very well that could very well be the reason why you are feeling sloth and torpor yeah because if you your mind state is kind of agitated like that and maybe you are feeling a bit of ill will yeah if your kids are being very naughty it is natural to <laughs> natural to get a bit upset sometimes this is kind of what happens with these things uh, so uh, try, yeah, try to maybe try to change your attitude. Yeah, try to correct your kids uh, in a more kind way, in a way where you're coming from more love and compassion, uh, where you try to see your kids in a different way. Yeah, try not to uh, come from, uh, if you come from ill will and harshness, it's going to be negative. Try to scold in a kind way so maybe scolding is the wrong word yeah correct them with kindness instead of with harshness and then when you do that when you come to your meditation i think it will change your attitude and you may very well have less stuff and torpor as a consequence Achan, some monks taught open eye awareness during sitting meditation wonder if this type of meditation practice is recommended by the buddha in the sutta and vinaya um, I, it, 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 I, 
you know, it, it depends, it all depends on what you are trying to achieve. And if you are trying to achieve deep meditation, if you're trying to follow the Anapanasati Sutta, the way it is described there, then closing your eyes is the way to go because the, the sense of sight is very dominant. It is very powerful and it takes up a lot of brain capacity. You will never really become peaceful if you have too much seeing. So it depends on what you want. If you just want to do a preliminary kind of meditation, just to kind of become reasonably peaceful, yeah, and not, not super, but reasonably peaceful, you can have your eyes open. You know, you, when you start out your meditation, you can start just by having your eyes open and just calming down, taking it gradually. But if you really want to be serious about meditation, if you want to become really peaceful, you're going to have to close your eyes because your eyes are going to be a hindrance to that depth of tranquility that you want. So it's not necessarily wrong, but it is only a very preliminary practice for the deeper practices. I can follow up on this same trend. The, the uh, argument given is that uh, we are we are open our eyes most of the time. We only sit down meditation a short time. So if we can learn to be aware with our eyes open, then it, it, it develops the mindfulness deeper. Yeah, yeah, may, yeah maybe. Maybe that, that's, that could well, you know, that's maybe true. Huh? But, uh, you know, it will make you a bit more peaceful and calm. And uh, it may have some beneficial effect. Try it. See if it works for you. See what the results are. Huh? But uh, so I'm... It is, but again, it is more like a preliminary practice, something that leads to meditation. Uh, and uh, in itself, it is um, maybe more like right effort, perhaps, yeah, having awareness, uh, having a sense of situational awareness. Uh, so it depends how you, I don't think we can call it real meditation, real Buddhist meditation, but maybe more like right effort or something like that. Uh. Thank you, Achan. Achan, is fear and worry a form of ill will too? Fear and worry is like um, a, a misunderstanding of the future. Yeah, it's like looking at the future with a kind of fault finding. I don't know if it is ill will, because it is considered separate from ill will in the suttas. Uh, in the suttas, you have the, uh, the fear is like a separate factor from from these things. Uh, uh, but it is like a view of the future, looking at the future with negative eyes. Instead of saying that your future is very likely to be a good one, if you are a good Buddhist, if you are living well, if you are treating people with kindness, if you're trying to develop your mind in a good way, your future is bright. Yeah, you're going to have a happy future because you are doing the things that lead to a good future. Uh, but instead, we are worried and concerned. And usually, it is just a habit from the past very often. Uh, we had maybe anxiety in the past life, and then we bring it into this life. Or we are looking at those things in the world that lead to anxiety. We're looking at the wars, we're looking at all of these things, and we think, oh no, the world is going the wrong way. But we forget that actually, that is not so important. What is important is how we live. Our future is created by how we live, not by what is happening in the world. So it's about attending to things in the right way. And when you attend to things in the right way, when you see that actually your future is probably not going to be an issue because if you live well, your future will be taken care of. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay. Yeah, great. Have a nice lunch, everyone. And we'll see you again after lunch. Thank you.